got to unmute herself. Unmute, John Marie. Hi, Adrian. There we go. Okay, girls, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so I lost visual for some reason, so give me one second. Um, I know that uh, Kristen, you had said that you have three cats. Uh, we have 10 cats and two dogs. So uh, <laughs> it is, uh, it, I, I would not be surprised if they, you know, if they, there you go, uh, if they chime in and have, uh, have a little addition to add. But uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I want to welcome everybody to our official second uh, women lead online forum brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And uh, my name is Sean Marie Tori, and I am a business strategist, and my specialty is in business development and creative strategy work with professionals and entrepreneurs. And uh, I am a longtime member of Connected Women of Influence. I think, gosh, going on eight years now. Uh, and Connected Women of Influence is a really incredible women's association that is invite only. And uh, they are doing some really incredible things. And I'm so happy that our, our founder is with us today on our call, uh, Michelle Berkowitz. So um, lots of really great things that I could share with you about uh, about Connected Women of Influence. and uh, But we're gonna dive right into today's online forum. And our topic today uh, for our show, which is called Truth is the New Black, is it has a cost. And I am absolutely delighted that I get to introduce our guest for today, Tony Purry. Uh, Tony is another sensational woman. Hi, Tony. Uh, Hi. Tony is an incredible woman, a powerful entrepreneur. She is an author. She wrote this really incredible book called The Hype Book, which really feeds into our topic today around faking it has a cost. Um, the Hype Book is really about owning and claiming the things that make you extraordinary, uh, which is the exact opposite of faking it. Uh, so we're gonna get to uh, pull from Tony's wisdom about that today. Tony is also starting an organization called Boost Entrepreneurs, which is a group for female entrepreneurs over 40. Um, so women of a particular age. Um, and I'm really excited. What's that? I said yes of a particular age. That's right. <laughs> uh, for, for those of us that have had some uh, some really delicious experiences, but uh, I'm so happy that you're that you're here today. And and the whole premise with the online forums is really for the passionate, creative, professional entrepreneur, um, for career women, for women that want to be part of a conversation that really goes there. And that's really our commitment to you, uh, our audience, is that we go there. And whether we are talking specifically about business or marketing or sales, or we dabble in politics, or we're talking about uh, women supporting one another collaboratively rather than competing with one another. Uh, the whole point of this is to really go there, to have a safe space where women like us can come together and have these really juicy conversations, unfiltered, uh, and not only talk about our similar similarities, but maybe even talk about our differences and, and through those differences, what commonalities really unite us and bring us together. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna kick things off uh, with our topic of faking it has a cost uh, by sharing a couple of things with you. So, a very dear friend of mine, um, who uh, may or may not be on this call, wink, wink, um, uh, gave me this really cool sticker from an event that she went to, and uh, it was really simple. It was, uh, the stickers were being handed out by a female entrepreneur uh, who owns a company that does um, uh, sexual wellness, uh, women's wellness, and she is a manufacturer of adult toys. And one of her stickers said, no fake friends, no fake orgasms. And I <laughs> love that. And, uh, and we're not going to go down the road of talking about, you know, great sex or bad sex, although I could spend a couple hours on that as well. But the reason that I wanted to start our conversation off with that is that 
I think it's interesting that there is this belief and this conditioning around women faking it. Uh, there is a famous scene in When Harry Met Sally uh, where Meg Ryan fakes an orgasm right in the middle of the Jewish diner. And uh, her head is flailing. And she, I mean, it was, you know, and it, as those of you that have seen it recall, like the girl next to her said, or the woman sitting across from her said, I want what she's having. Um, so there is power in getting there, but I think that there's also power in having the conversation about why have women been conditioned? Uh, I mean, comedians have talked about this. It's been joked about in movies and sitcoms. And, and I think that there is this underlying pervasive message around faking it. Um, Tony and I were talking too that there is this idea of fake it till you make it. And it has been, it's been thought to be something really positive, like just fake it till you make it. Um, but how about if today, all of the women on this call, that we start to dive into what it would look like and feel like to change the dynamics of that idea? What if it's not fake it till you make it? What if it's believe it until you make it? What if it is do the work until you make it? Um, one of uh, my favorite sayings, and I think it's Susie's as well, is learn to love the necessary hard work. It's really hard work, ladies. Um, but I also believe in the power of visualization and imagining yourself there, but that is different than faking it. And I'm going to share one more thing with you, and then I'm going to have Tony jump in and talk a little bit about her experience around the opposite side of faking it, which is hyping it. Like, uh, like I said earlier, her book called The Hype Book is about owning and admitting the things that make you extraordinary. So we're going to go there in just a second. Uh, this has been my experience. Directly or indirectly, for a very long time now, women have been encouraged and in some cases rewarded for faking it. Uh, and at what cost? What is the cost of our faking it? What is, it has to do with mounting pressure for perfection, visibility, influencing followers, likes, fans, to look younger, to be younger, to stay relevant, to be an expert. That's a whole nother topic that we're gonna dive in today is, is faking that you're an expert when you're really not there yet. Uh, it is no wonder that we are more stressed and less engaged and why we are so hungry, if not starving, for something genuine and authentic and sincere. We know the truth when we see it and when we feel it, and it is intoxicating, ladies, so stop faking it. You deserve better, and you deserve to know what it feels like to bring the real you to the party. You are perfect and amazing just the way you are. So with that, I would love to throw this over to Tony. And, uh, and Tony, I'd like to know what your experience has been with this idea of faking it. Of In your experience, what has it cost you? Um, have you had any personal real experiences with that? And what has it been for you? What has it been like for you to bring this idea of hyping yourself to the market? You know, have, have women embraced that? Have you seen resistance around that? Um, I think that you have a lot to share on this topic, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. First of all, I'm really excited. I love Michelle and this whole group, and I think what you all are all about um, is the kind of empowerment that we, especially as women, need in order to bring our very best to what we do and how we contribute uh, to, to our work, to our societies, our communities. Um, so I, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about my background so you understand where my philosophy has come from in this realm um, in, on the topic. I have been a career PR person. I ran my own uh, lifestyle travel and tourism agency for 10 years up until just about two years ago. And our clients were luxury hotels and destinations and airlines and all of that wonderful, you know, all that wonderful stuff. 
Um, but we also had university. We'd have, you know, small chefs, small businesses, uh, female owned and operated businesses. So we were a generalist agency, but we really, the lines for revenue came from the hospitality and lifestyle space. And I always had the philosophy with that business of representing our clients by really honing in on the gifts and talents and specialties and those things that they did really, really well. Naturally, with our big clients, they had a lot to boast about. You know, the hotels could boast about their, you know, their thread count and their star chef and their, you know, amazing spa. But it was... I was always really interested in the small clients, the independent clients that I work with. And the way we succeeded with them was we really hone in on what they did really well. Um, what made them a star? They were starting out, but we focused in on what is it that makes you unique, that makes you um, different than everybody else. What is it that's going to draw people into you? Because when we really focus in on those things, those gifts, those qualities, those talents that we have, we, we bring uh, a level of confidence to the table with that. And so we could always promote them with... Um, a lot of truth and a lot of conviction because we knew we were promoting exactly who they were. There are a lot of PR firms that are all about smoke and mirrors. And I was just never that person. I, if I don't believe in it, I can't promote it. I'm just, I made A, I told you Sean Marie the other night, I made A's and C's in college. I'd make an A in everything I love and I'd see my way out of everything else and drove my parents bananas, but it was because I could be really get into and be really passionate about those areas that I was really interested in. But the ones that I didn't, I just, I couldn't, there was no interest for me. So I've always been one to be really true to who I believe in and could represent. Um, what The way my book came about, about is after uh, about eight years of running agency, I, I, I was burned out and I was really just over it. I was tired. I had a wonderful team of rock star employees. We had great clients, but I was overwhelmed. I was exhausted. I was burnt out. And I didn't know how to um, own that that's the way I was feeling because we're kind of taught to keep, we're, we're, we're killing it. We're doing it. We're, you know, and I've been calling the company my baby for eight years. I didn't want the baby anymore. And I didn't know how to admit that because it felt, you know, <laughs> like a loser move. Here you were so hard to build this company and now you don't want it. And we were award winning, we were succeeding, we were doing well. And I didn't tell anybody I was suffering or I was suffering in silence. It was a really miserable time. Mm. Well, I started to scale the business back um, moved home, started working, you know, from this office and just felt like, what have you done? You have walked away from something that was doing really well and thriving. And now, and I'm the type of person I like to work in community. I loved having people in the office and music on and doing fun things. So to go from that to isolation felt like punishment for me. And um, my, I was walking through the living room and my husband was watching a documentary about Muhammad Ali. And at this point, I had no confidence at all. And I realized a lot of my confidence came from what I had built with my company and the client represented and the employees that I had because they were so good. And, and the company, it was a mantle that I didn't even realize it was, you know, it was my identity. And I didn't have that anymore. And so I really felt like a loser. So I walked through the living room and my husband is watching this documentary about Muhammad Ali. And I am captivated by his confidence. I'm not a big boxing fan, but I am just mesmerized. How did this man maintain his confidence in the face of defeat? How did he maintain it when the country hated him because he didn't support the Vietnam War? How did he maintain it when he was stricken with Parkinson's disease? And he still, every image that you think of of him is a man of confidence. And so a couple of clips later, I thought, you know, well, if we all had a hype man, you know, no, 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 no. I, I, a couple of clips later, I saw Boone Brown, his hype man, his corner man, right before Ali was going into a fight. 
and he was reminding him about all his wins, his knockouts, the mm. greatest, that he was the champ. And I thought, well, if we all had a hype man, <laughs> you know, remind us of all of our wins, of all of our knockouts, of our gifts, our talents, our strengths, our abilities, then we'd have that kind of confidence as well. So I sat down in my living floor and I started journaling about my wins over the years. And I cut out pictures and I journaled in great detail because I needed to start seeing myself through my success lens. Because when I was in this place of feeling lonely and isolated, I was also comparing myself to everybody else out there that mm -hmm. seemed like they were succeeding. And it just was life-changing for me doing that. I journaled about launching the company in 2007 and soaring in spite of the recession. I journaled about pro bono work that we've done for nonprofits, big accounts that we won, personal things like running the LA Marathon. Doing that, there was this ascension confidence that rose up in me because I was now looking at myself through my success lens and it made such a big difference in who I am, who I saw myself to be. And I realized instead of feeling like this was the end, I realized, wait, I've got all of this to build on, you know, that this was a springboard. And it also gave me permission to just be in a place of surrender where I didn't know what was next. Mm -hmm. It felt very good to say, I'm leaving that because I'm to do this. But when you're like, I'm leaving that and I really don't know where I'm going and you're <laughs> over 40, it doesn't sound <laughs> so great. But this process brought me to a place of really feeling a sense of self-assurance and really excited about, you know, doing what's next. Um, I like to tell that story because there also is a thing that, a philosophy that people feel like, well, just fake it till you make it. Just put yourself out there in a way Create that website and use the language we when it's just you, you know, all of these things that create the image of you being bigger and more established and all of things. And I have a challenge with that. I mm -hmm. think there's a lot that I bring to the table myself that it's okay to say I'm starting something new. I'm in a new position. I'm doing something different that there's some power in that. And then you don't feel vulnerable as, as you do when you think the world's gonna find out, you know, that I'm the wizard behind this curtain and I really don't have the power that, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that I've been boasting that I have, you know, have. And I don't think that allows us to go out and be in this world with the confidence that we have when we just own who we are, when we take the time to take inventory of the things that we've accomplished, the ways we've contributed, the talents, the gifts, the strengths that we have, I think we walk with more authenticity, even though that word is, you know, really overused now, but we walk in that and we walk in a confidence in that, that I think we're all better for. And we can walk into a room, you know how it is, you walk into a room and you see somebody that's confident in who they are, that there's something about that that just draws you in. And that's kind of my new philosophy. So when Sean Marie, when we started talking about this, I'm like, I love this topic mm -hmm. because as a PR person, it is sort of counter cultural for what my business does because it can be about smoke and mirrors. I just don't believe it has to be in order to show your best and to be your best. Mm. Tony, that is so good. And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I think that, you know, the day of the snake oil salesman and um, I think it's antiquated, you know, and I love me some Tony Robbins. Like I was up at midnight ordering his cassette tapes um, because <laughs> CDs weren't around yet and the internet wasn't around yet. Um, like talk about a guy that can like hype up a room and, um, you yeah. know, but I really feel like it is a new day and it is no longer business as usual. And, you know, I know for myself and for you, Tony, and for many women on this call, like part of our passion is like, let's bring some sincerity back to the conversation. Let's bring some love and generosity into the boardroom. Um, I'm just going to say it. Let's bring some estrogen into the White House. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that it is time for 
that culmination and that that meeting of absolutely owning it, which is why I love that you and I get to kind of frame this conversation with like, don't fake it on either end of the spectrum. Don't, right. don't pretend that there's a we when it's just me, but by the same token, and I'd love to dive into this next, like there is that other side of false modesty. Like don't yeah. fake that you're not amazing. Right. Don't right. fake it that you don't want attention or like, oh, not me or oh, gosh, you know, this whole thing. Um, it's it's disingenuous. Right. Like there's a right. there's like false modesty has the same repulsion as, you know, being overly gregarious or being, you know, like showing up and pretending that you're all this when you really don't feel that you are um, like they both have a repelling energy. And I think the reason that that is, is because it doesn't ring true to us, right? Like going back to the fact that we know the truth by the way it feels, by the way it looks, by the way it sounds, by the way, it, like it, it has a texture to it. Um, and one of my teachers, uh, his name is Josh Pice. He's an actor and he worked primarily with actors for a really long time. Uh, he has a program called Committed Impulse and I've worked with Josh now, I don't know, seven, eight, nine times. Uh, and I'm always in a room full of actors and actresses and comedians, uh, which I am none of those things, although I, I can be a little funny. I was Miss Sense of Humor. I'm going to brag. I was Miss Sense of Humor <laughs> in seventh grade. Um, so maybe I'm a little funny, but anyway, the point is, is that I'm in this room with these professional actors and I don't know, I have no idea what I'm doing there from a performance perspective, but what that work helps me do is stay very connected in the moment to my truth, to what I'm actually feeling. And that's what I would really love to see us bring to the world of business. Like, let's right. just say like, Hey, I'm not there yet. Um, but this is what I'm doing now to get there and bring people right. with us on our journey. And Tony, I think you and I went through like 10 different, uh, possibilities for this conversation. One of which was, um, okay, you're a coach now. So what, or, um, okay, you're a coach now. Uh, what does that really mean? Like, like you and I had this whole conversation around this this epidemic that we are experiencing that is happening in the coaching industry, which both you and I uh, have been included in, in spite of the fact that we have 20, 30, 35 years of business behind us. And so one of the things that I would love to chat about is uh, this idea of taking a weekend seminar or, um, you know, going and getting certified in, you know, widget making, uh, and then suddenly coming out and saying, I am now a, an expert widget maker, even though I just started. And it's no fault to the coaching. I think it is the industry. I think that there is this thing that is happening where people are going and being taught, like, come take our weekend seminar. You're going to leave here. You're going to charge $10,000 an hour. And you're going to go out and start claiming that you're the expert. Uh, and I think that it is incredibly problematic. And I'm wondering, like, what do we do about that? And it's not from the competitive perspective, but I think that it is, it is a dynamic that is damaging. Um, and I think it is the same thing that perpetuates this idea around social media and having it to be beautiful and photoshopped and this idea of perfection. And there's another book, Michelle and I have been talking a lot about this, uh, Feck Perfection. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it's all about um, that there really is no perfection, but there is heart and there is honesty. And that is in and of itself perfection. Right, like you bringing your most authentic self and Tony, like you said, it's a little overused, but it is so true. Um, so what is your experience from a professional perspective? Like what are you out in, and, I, and I'd love to open it up to anybody else that would like to jump in, but what are you seeing out in the business world, in your industry, where uh, there is this potential um, thread or message of people feeling like they have to fake it, that they have to pretend that there's something that they're not in order to gain followers or gain attention or even gain credibility. Like, have any of you had any experiences where um, 
that has affected your business or where it has affected you personally or where you have seen it really completely just fall flat? You know, I, when you uh, first said the statement, fake it till you make it, the, the very first time I heard that, I was repelled by that idea because it just, it's, and it's an old one now. I mean, we've been saying that for like 15 years. And yes. Yeah. It seemed to me like it was, uh, it was yet another dumbing down of women's abilities by saying, well, if you can't, just fake it till you make it and, and everything will be great, you know, and. Uh, and I used to think, well, what's wrong with saying I'm not doing so great? I, you know, I, I could use a little help here. And when I was first starting my business, I found it actually, even before I started my business, anytime I tried something new in business, even when I was still in corporate, if I wanted to do something new or learn something new, most of the time I went to a male colleague and got their input and I got their feedback because there was something about admitting to another woman that I didn't know how to do this, you know, that I didn't, I, I didn't know how to do something or I wasn't sure about launching an entrepreneurial business or, you know, any, any of that kind of stuff. So, and I, I wonder if some of that comes from this whole idea of, well, I mean, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Fake it until you make it, or we started faking it until we make it because of the way we felt about things. I, 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 I would, uh, go ahead, Michelle. No, I was just going to say, I have a different perspective, only because I use that phrase all the time. I mean, probably to ad nauseum. But to me, I mean, it's interesting on this topic. I was really excited about the topic, know that. Um, but to me, fake it until you make it. I know when I started my business, I don't know what the hell I was doing. I mean, it's like, and you guys know my whole philosophy is make shit up as you go, which is even more <laughs> dangerous. But I think for me, what fueled me on the fake it till you make it was not to be not authentic or not sincere. It was to be very honest that I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I was just trying stuff and I was trying to make, make it successful. So for me, it actually fueled me as opposed to, I hope, not making it out in the community or when I would reach people that I was being, you know, fake or insincere or something like that. But it, it was something that was very core to my growth in my business because I just, it kind of like, like, get your big girl pants on. I was like, when I felt like I was unclear about what I was doing or confident, I would go, just fake it till you make it and you'll figure it the F out. So that's Absolutely. my take on it. But I don't know what you guys think. You well, know, because I'm just, I'm just going to jump in here really quickly. Anybody who's not sharing, would you mind muting your mic? Um, and then go ahead and, and unmute if you want to share. We're just getting quite a bit of feedback. It may be, if somebody's using their phone also, oh, to, as instead of their computer, there may be that feedback in addition to you. If you're using the phone and the computer. Yeah, no, nobody's on the phone. So. Okay. I, you know, in in response to what Michelle said, I think um, I think it's more like what you were doing, Michelle, was like just just move forward. You know, move forward. Be the uh, content with not being perfect. Moving forward until it becomes perfect. If we wait for perfection, we never do anything. You know. Yeah, I can I can really relate to both sides of this. I was thrown into a family business, a male dominated industry at a very young age. And I felt like I had a full on fake it till I made it. And so like, I can relate to Michelle when starting her business. And I just, I really had to, I mean, even fake confidence until I believed that I was, then the confidence came and I believed it. Um, but at the same time, getting to a place where I think there comes that time where you, you get to that place, you realize you can't fake it anymore because you really don't know what the hell you're doing and, and you need to start asking those questions and reach out. And I think in doing that and in asking my father-in-law, you know, show me how to do this or in these, these sales classes where I was thrown into a class of 40, 40 year old men and I was a 25 year old woman, you know, in an automotive industry. I realized I just needed to ask. I needed to raise my hand and ask and say, I didn't, I don't understand to the instructor. And I learned that every other man sitting there had the same question I had. They didn't, 
know what was happening either. And so to me, that, that showed me how powerful not faking it was at the same time saying, I don't understand this. And so, so yeah, there's both sides to it. And, but learning that lesson and that being authentic and saying, Hey, I don't understand this. I need to figure it out. Help me figure it out. There is a lot of power in that as well. I, I agree that there is, and I believe in that mindset of fake it to make it. I understand that always because like you, Michelle, I would, I'm one that will try something that I have no clue about and just have the confidence somehow I'm going to figure out how to pull this off, you know? And I think that's what a lot of, as women, what we do, where the challenge has come with this is this persona that that I'm finding a lot of, of, of especially young women, and I, I'm going to be very honest with you, I'm seeing this more in younger women than I am seeing in women that are over 40, because I think we're kind of like, this is who I am, you got what you got, <laughs> you know, and we're figuring out as we go along, and we're not ashamed of that. But where I am, Shami and I talked about where you see these people who take a course, who um, who project to be bigger, more experienced, more established than they are, and then are very insecure. They carry a lot of insecurity around that because they're worried that somebody's going to figure out that they really aren't who they say they are. I think there are trappings to that when it goes from being a mindset to being a thing that you are actually putting out in the world that says, I am very successful graphics designer. And really all you've done is, you know, taking the Udemy courses. Um, and I'm not just, that's not to say that people don't have natural talent and they find themselves in these places. Um, but I think there's just a real danger in, in, owning what we have in our ability and using that to fuel us and give us the confidence to stand up and say, I'm doing something new, even if I don't have a ton of experience doing it and not being ashamed about that. Um, Sean Marie said, this is beta, Tony. We're, we're in our beta stage of doing this. So everything may not go as you know, smoothly as it. And I love that she's, you know, I love that. I'm like, okay, well, we just got it. Let's figure out how to make this, you know, succeed so that it goes on, you know, getting better every time. But, but I think there's something about the honesty about how we approach presenting ourselves to the world that we walk in that much more confidence in who we are. We walk in that much more um, self-assuredness uh, and what we have and what we have to bring to the table. And we don't have to sit in this place of being worried of being discovered um, or found out, you know. I, I, it's the, it's the, the, it's seeing the Wizard of Oz and the Wiz as a, as a child that just sort of haunted me. I mean, the part of that movie that just unnerves me so much is when the Wizard is found out. I like, I have a visceral experience <laughs> when I see that. You know, because I'm always very uncomfortable when I find out, that when I see a person who isn't really who they project themselves, you know, to be. And I, I think we just do ourselves a disservice in doing that. And, and we have so much more that we can be really proud of and draw our confidence from than creating this smoke screen. I say in the book, a lot of times, we dwell on our mistakes, our failures and setbacks, we will ruminate over that stuff for days, for weeks. For We will think about something that happened 10 years ago and get all, you know, I should have, I would, I, you know, I didn't handle that the best. But we achieve things and then we're on to the next and then we're on to the next and we're on to the next. So if you think about the amount of mental real estate that we're giving to our failures, our setbacks, those mistreatments versus the things that we are accomplishing, it's grossly imbalanced. If you start focusing on what our abilities are, the strengths are, those things that we do bring to the table, and that become the way you see yourself, you show up so much more uh, confident and self-assured and able to pour out and into others' lives. Can I add, to, I want to just say, Tony, you're so right. I mean, my, my comment on that, when you started talking about the younger generation, um, and that's excluding you, Kristen, I'm just letting you know, because you're that younger generation, but you know, 
to me, there's a word that came to mind when you were talking and it was substance. It's like, I can handle fake it till you make it. But if there's no there, there that you've got some depth or experience, then you're just a, you're just a bunch of crap. Right. And that's what I see. I do see with a lot of young, let's call them what they think are influencers. And it just drives me crazy. Cause I'm like, you want to be an entrepreneur. You want to start your own business. And I go, you have no substance to you. And you're trying to do that. So I don't know. I think it, maybe it's experience or wisdom, but that, that's my take on that. So. I agree. You know, and if this is crazy. Undo, they put this crazy under pressure on themselves. Yeah. So they're walking around trying to live up to this thing that, you know, and, and that's not fair. Shamari, you were going to say? Yeah, no, I was just going to say to what you're saying, Tony. I mean, that's why when I, when I was writing, you know, a little something about what our talk was going to be today, uh, I'm just going to say this again. With mounting pressure for perfection, visibility, influence, followers, likes, fans, to look younger, to be younger, to stay relevant, to be an expert. And you know, what I think is really interesting is that um, the majority of us, and Kristen, you might be the exception, but I think most of us uh, grew up and even got into business pre-internet. You know, my first job, uh, or one of my first big jobs after I sold my first company, which was in 1984, uh, was with a huge internet service provider. And so people were still like the worldwide, what the, what's this interweb thing? So I was selling website design and I was selling internet connectivity while people were still on dial up. And then we upgraded to DSL, woo DSL. Um, you know, so I've seen business pre-internet and post-internet. And I know one of the things that I've heard a lot of women talking about is, and, and even men, um, is that we of a certain generation cannot imagine the amount of pressure it would be to be growing up right now with social media. So back to what you were saying, Michelle, and what you were saying, Tony, my experience is that I think women of a certain age um, on, the, on the older end of the spectrum, we don't own it. Like I think, again, the fake it till you make it, the faking it has a cost, um, for, for us, it tends to be that we're still acquiescing to like, oh, I don't know. I'm not ready. It's not perfect. Um, you know, too many other people are doing it. Um, I should go get a degree. Like, like we tend to downplay our exquisiteness as where the younger generation, um, there is this constant pressure to oversell it to be perfect, to have these, you know, glossy, ins like I cannot even imagine. And my hope for today's conversation is that we can start to bridge that gap simply in the conversation. If we hear somebody younger talking about like, oh, I'm the shit and I'm this and I'm that and my ass and my nine bazillion gazillion followers and I'm an influencer and Michelle I loved what you said substance you're an influencer of what lipstick mascara um and believe me I am an entrepreneur's entrepreneur so I'm like girl you can go get you some money you know schlocking this or doing that or being an influencer that's great but what I am so hungry for I think what we are so hungry for and I think this is one of the reasons that connected women of influence has been such a successful organization is that it is about sincerity. It is not just open to the masses. It is not at, like, Michelle, you'd probably have 10,000 members by now if you just opened it up to everybody, but we don't. We have a little over 600 members. We've been at this for, I say we, I hope you don't mind, Michelle. We've been at this for 11 years. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to like, I'm going to give some hype to Michelle, but it's, it's because there is that thread of sincerity and Michelle, back to what you were saying about like, you know, you hope that you weren't insincere by faking it till you make it. I think that there is a world of difference of being like, you know what? I don't know my ass or my elbow right now, but I'm going to go for it. Um, and I'm going to show up and I'm going to bring this to the party and I hope that it hits. And if it doesn't, then we'll learn from the experience. And Michelle, that is who you are at your core. And I know as someone who's known you for a really long time, uh, there has never been an element of you faking it. There has definitely been an element of courageousness and fearlessness. And for those of us that don't feel fearless, it makes us a little nervous because we're like, I wouldn't do that. I couldn't do that. And Michelle, you have pulled things off in this organization 
that many of us only dream about because you had that willingness to call it whatever you want to call it, fake it till you make it, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the cost of really faking it, of pretending, of not being present and genuine and saying, you know what, this is really what's happening. And in the uh, CWI inner circles, we talk about that. In this kind of gathering, we get to talk about that. Like, hey, it's really hard and it's really scary. And my whole mission and, and desire for today's conversation is for those of us that are hiding and playing small and not owning how extraordinary we are at certain things, um, that we start to shed that veil, that we start to show up, that we say, hey, you know what, I'm really good at this this is my magic and that we really start to own that instead of faking that we don't have it and on the flip side that we can be contributors to the other part of the conversation which is like sweetheart you need to take a seat and you need to go back to school and you need to take a minute and you need to engage in this conversation and be really present and let's really talk you know and keeping in the theme of the women lead online forms, like we're going to go there. And one of the things that I know as an absolute truth is that everybody wants to be seen and heard, no exceptions. And that goes for the younger generation too. They, they want to really be seen, not their, not the version of them. Right. And I think that that is true across the board, whether you're 18 or 88, we just want to be seen and really genuinely heard and have somebody really look us right in the eyes and be like, sweetheart, I see you, I feel you, and you are so not alone. And we are a hundred miles away from that if we continue to fake it. So, Michelle? Can I, oh, okay, so comment, you know, only because, and Tony, I wrote down a word I was like, I want to give some hype to. I was like, I'm going to start using that now. It's like, no more shout outs. It's like, give a little <laughs> hype to. So there's a new phrase for you. But, you know, it's interesting what you were saying, Sean. I mean, first of all, thanks for all the kudos on CWI. We will own that all day long. So thank you. But it was, it's interesting when we talk about, you know, fake it till you make it too. Because I remember years ago, one of our members, and this is a reason we started the Inner Circles years ago, because one of our very young members said to me, you know, Michelle, I love when we have on our, our meetings and our events and she goes, um, you know what, but I, I feel like every time I look around this room, I don't know if this group is the right fit for me because she goes, everybody that I see when I come to meetings just seems like their world is perfect and everything's wonderful. And I just about died. I said, are you kidding me? I go, just peel back the layers of people. And it was at that point that I went, that's as a society for us in business, what what I think is a bit of a challenge is that we have to put it out there that everything's wonderful, everything's great, but then wh where do you show the true vulnerability and authenticity? Because you don't want everybody to see you in your head trash for that day. Do you know what I mean? That's, I think, what's yeah. a challenge too on that subject, on this subject. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment really quickly on that and then open it back up. Um, I think that there's a there's a saying, and I it might have been coined in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know where it was coined originally, but it, they they say don't lead with your chin. And in twelve step programs, there comes a point in doing the twelve steps where you make a list of everybody that you've harmed or that you owe money to. So you make this list of people that you need to make an amends to. And then in step nine, I believe it is, you start making these amends to people. And one of the things that they say is don't lead with your chin. In other words, you don't go to your next door neighbor's husband and say, hey, Joe, I just want to let you know that I've been sleeping with your wife and I'm really sorry. It's not happening anymore, but I'm really sorry. Um, like definitely making an, an amends and, you know, and admitting, acknowledging, not faking it, like what's not working or the things that where we've screwed up or where we've had a major fuck up or what's happening behind the scenes. Um, we don't share that with everybody. I think it is really important that we maintain the integrity of owning where we're at. And I think that that is those wounds, those things that make us really tender, I think that they're sacred and they deserve to be shared with a sacred audience 
period, end of discussion. Where I think the authenticity can arrive is to say, hey ladies, you know what? We have, we have 600 members, but let me tell you what, um, I remember when we started with five and we were sitting at a coffee shop around a table. Um, we have worked our asses off to get here, but this did not happen overnight and it hasn't always been pretty and our sound has gone out and audio didn't show up and you know, the email went out and it had the wrong location and nobody showed up. That's what I'm talking about personally, is having this space where we can be like, hey, it is not perfect. Just like Tony said, when I shared with her, I was like, hey, Tony, this is a brand new launch. This is our second session. Um, but please come be part of this conversation. So whether we have 100 women on the call or one woman on the call, what I know that Tony and I is we're going to bring it. We're, <laughs> that's okay, Kristen. Uh, we're gonna bring it like we are talking to the masses um, because our heart's in it, you know? Um, so, so being able, and Tony, thank you for acknowledging like that we talked about that, like, hey, this is a new thing that we're trying. And to your credit, once yeah. again, Michelle, like we're gonna jump in and give this a shot and see what works and course correct and tighten things up. Um, but we're gonna connect and we're gonna make this a sacred experience uh, because we can and because we give a shit and because we want to bring some truth to this particular conversation. So can I mention too, Michelle, when you said about the young woman looking at the other people around them, that, that, that comparison thing is a real challenge as well, which is what compels people oftentimes to feel like they have to fake it <clears throat> or, you know, project untruths in order to feel accepted or feel worthy. Part of what the, my book is about is um, finding that inner advocate. It's, it's looking at really who you are, those gifts, those talents, those qualities that you have within yourself so that you feel a sense of worthiness because we don't naturally spend the time dwelling on thinking about celebrating our accomplishments, but we do that when we have setbacks and failures and mistreatments naturally the way we see ourselves and the way we think of ourselves is maybe not that we're quite worthy or because we're looking at somebody else saying look what they've accomplished and we're looking through a veneer that isn't usually a truthful one at that there when i wrote the book um i wrote this one thing and every time i read it I, i'm always like do i write that's really good <laughs> um, i want to read it to you it's, um, it says, when you, there are no two people in the world that have identical fingerprints and that your DNA and genetic makeup are composed of a symphony of cells, neurons, and chromosomes that are specifically designed to distinguish you from every other person in the world. It seems unreasonable to ever compare yourself to another. Sure, we admire the qualities and characteristics in others, but you're an original creation made for a unique purpose. And for that reason, your greatest admiration should begin within. Mm. I love that because it really, I mean, just think if somebody said to you, I'm giving you a rare jewel. This is a diamond that is a one of a kind in the world it is the most rare thing i mean it is precious we can't even give it a price because it's worth so much because there's nothing like it in the world you would feel like oh my gosh have this thing you put it in a safe place in your home and you'd show it to people and you you know you would marvel at it well that's you <laughs> that's each and every one of us because we are that nobody else has these pink thumbprints right here. Not a single person. Nobody else has the life experience that I have that can bring a thing to able, bring to this conversation. All of us could leave this conversation and have just as powerful of uh, input. And just Susie, your example about working and asking for help, that's, all of these comments are powerful and so when we see ourselves that way there is less of a need to fake it in that way that's projecting something that we aren't but really more owning who we are and walking in a, in a real sense of confidence around who that is because we're all designed to bring something different we're all designed to do something different we're all designed to have a different impact 
where I could speak to a person, Sean Marie may have a greater influence, you know, on them. Adrian may have a greater in influence. These are, we're all going to come at it very differently because of who we are and how differently we approach things and see things and what we've been exposed to and those gifts and talents and unique abilities that we have. And those are things that I think we should celebrate. And, and mm. those are the things that I think feed our sense of confidence. Can I add something to that? Um, I'm yeah. remembering and I'm reflecting on, and when you started saying how, you know, you started journaling your accomplishments, I'm remembering um, a few years back when I decided to leave the family business, uh, my daughter was helping me put together uh, my resume because I was going to start looking for something different. And I was applying for another position and I was having to ask some friends for letters of recommendations. And I think, Michelle, you were one of those people I asked. And the letters that came in, the things people said about me, I was floored. And when I finished my resume, I could not believe the things that were on my resume. I had no you know, concept, really. I hadn't thought about it for 25 years. I worked a family business. I felt so dang good. <laughs> the stuff, the yeah. letters that came in, the things people said about me gave me such a com confidence and another reflection of myself so everyone just make a new resume <laughs> some person. they were all your hype men when i did honestly when i did the book i said it's kind of like it is like when you do your resume a lot of times we don't look at it our history of accomplishments until we're doing our resume and then you're like oh i forgot i did. and then you're like i could ask for more actually a higher pay or a, a better, a higher position. Exactly. Because exactly. you're looking yeah. at yourself and seeing, wow, I am worth more. Mm. I've done more or I know more. And so like the first half of the book is offices. Those practices are simply things that make you, that trigger those thoughts about yourself that mm -hmm. say, oh, oh, I'm really good at this. Oh, I have that. And then the second half is journaling and not just listing. I mean, I you don't have to have a book to do this, but don't list what you've accomplished. And, and the way I have it is you go through a questions where you ask, um, um, what was it, what, let's see, you know, one of the, so here's one is, what was your significant victory? What made this accomplishment significant? What sto what's the story behind this victory? Mm -hmm. What did it take for you to accomplish this significant victory? And there's a list of things you can check off. What strengths do you realize about yourself as a result of this significant victory? How did you celebrate that accomplishment? So you are picking it apart the same way you pick apart that thing that you feel like you failed at. Because you know, we, we really, we go in and dissect the sucker really mm -hmm. good like we're playing that game operation that we had when we were kids yeah but how do you dissect those accomplishments the same way i had one of my girlfriends call me one night and she said tony i got all kids in bed and all of my to-do list and it's nine o'clock this is a victory and i'm like that is a victory and, and those are those things that when you remember that you've done that you, you, that's where you find that advocate. That's where you hype yourself up because when those days where you don't have it, um, you forget that you're even able to do it. You know, you're like, I'm such a loser. I didn't get anything done. My kids are crying. My husband's screaming, you know, but there are so many things that we are accomplishing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just the big things that help us to feel really self-assured and, and confident about what we bring you know, to a table or to a discussion. Absolutely. You know, I, I was, uh, when I uh, worked for Mitchell in San Diego, I um, had developed a training program around um, team building. And it, it was just something I did to, to share with my team and then started sharing it with other folks in the company and stuff. So even before I went out on my own, I was already doing this and then was asked to take it to other associations and organizations and present it. So I'd already done this a number of times. And then I went out on my own and, you know, kind of by word of mouth, some of my first clients were nonprofits. I did work with uh, the YMCA. I did work with the Girl Scouts um, of America, uh, with a few other um, nonprofits. And then somebody heard me speak at a conference and asked me to come in and pitch a workshop to their, their senior level team. And it happened to be a, a corporate 
company in San Diego. And so I go in and I meet with them and they had wanted, you know, a list of clients and where had I presented this and blah, blah, blah. And, and I remember the, the CIO looking at me and saying, well, you don't really have any corporate experience. And I, I sort of was like, it was like he poked a balloon and I just was like, Ooh, you know, because yeah, as a client, I didn't, I didn't have any corporate experience. And, you know, and I, I don't even know what I said. Somehow I sang and danced through it, you know, whatever. And, and on the way home, I'm, I called a friend of mine and I said, man, this, this thing just happened. And he just totally called me out. And, and she goes, and you feel like a fraud, right? And I said, yeah, I feel like a fraud. And she said, yeah, because he made you feel like a fraud. Do you have any corporate experience? And I was like, well, no. And she goes, oh, where were you working before you went out on your own? And I'm like, oh yeah, right. I am Miss Corporate, right? And she just, and then she shared something with me that really blew me away because I had hired her at Mitchell a few years before to come in and do a small project. And she said, are you aware that you were my first corporate client. And I was like, no. <laughs> I had no idea. And she said, all I had was academic experience. I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. You know, so it, it just took the right frame to change it, you know, and, and I still got that job. I got that gig and it was a, it was a good gig. And well, actually it was a pretty awful gig. Um, but not because of me, it was because of them, <laughs> but it just the reframing of it. Like, do you feel like a fraud? Yes. I feel like a fraud. Why do you feel like a fraud? You're not a fraud, you know, was That's right. really interesting. It was a good experience. Well, Patty, sh thank you so much for sharing that. And, uh, ladies, we're, le we're down to our last few minutes. Uh, and I cannot thank you enough. This call has been absolutely incredible today and what an honor and a treat for me to, uh, to be your host. And Tony, thank you for being such an exquisite guest. And to our visitors, um, you've been amazing and thank you for the feedback and, you know, just giving us your love and, and feeling your presence come through the you know, come through this circle. So uh, what I thought we could end with is I'm going to, I'm going to share something with you from Feck Reflection. And then what I'd love to do is have, since, since we have a small intimate group today, I think it would be really fun uh, if each of you uh, opened up your mic and just shared with us um, one of the ways that makes you um, an extraordinary human being or entrepreneur or mother or wife or sister, um, and just share something with us that is um, that you really know is yeah. exquisite and beautiful about you. Uh, and then I will close this out and we'll call it um, a beautiful meeting. So I'm going to share this with you. Uh, so this is from uh, James Victoria, again, Fact Perfection. Uh, and this is called You Don't Fit In. All my life, I've heard the same refrain from teachers, friends, and family. Why can't you be normal? What they are really trying to say is, you don't fit in. Hell, I agree, I don't fit in. Uh, not only because I don't want to, because I can't. I just wasn't born that way. It is literally impossible, barring a full frontal lobotomy, for me or you to behave like anyone else is impossible. There are times a little get-along, go-along, social lubrication, but I can see it. Fitting in denotes a lack of character. Humans are social creatures. We want to belong. We want people to like us. It's natural to want more friends, more customers, more attention. But when we have to change who we are to achieve the goal, a problem arises. We begin to sell off parts that made us different and special in the first place. We lose our authenticity. We lose our voice. People follow leaders who have something to say and who stand for something. When an individual or an enterprise has nothing to say, they're no longer leading but following. Knowing that you don't fit in is your first glimpse of greatness. It is the first step toward understanding your gifts and finding your creative potential. You weren't born to fit in, ready to accommodate every relationship, every situation, every client. Do not contort yourself to fit into a box or a square or a cubicle. The world has enough safe, bland, dull crap. You are an artist. You are a genius. Don't fit in. Don't even try. So I would like to open it up and have you girls share uh, something that is extraordinary about you.
So who wants so, to start? <laughs> see how this, this is that thing? This is it. When I'm doing workshops, this is the thing that, especially women, are always, ah, let me think, I get, because they're so used to not owning it and having a sense of hype about those things that are really strong. Where, where, where are your gifts? Okay. Say them, say them proudly, and don't be afraid. Okay, Charlesetta. Okay, so first of all, that was a technical issue. I couldn't figure out how to unmute. <laughs> okay, oh, yes. say it. Yes. Say it. <laughs> now you know. I love it. I was like, okay. Um, so, and then as I thought about this, when I first started and hopped on, you guys are kind of getting going. The one thing that popped into my head for me is that I often say that I am a unicorn. Like, I do not fit in. But I'm also a woman of a particular age, and it, it works for me, right? So I, some of those comments earlier were about the, the, where we are in life, right? Um, but I like to say that I am imperfectly imperfect. Like, I am going to screw up because I will try and say yes to a lot of things, right? That I have absolutely no idea about. And so what I've learned later in life and that I now try to empower the next generation who I do believe is significantly challenged with this whole influencer lifestyle and instant fame and expertise thing. Um, but just to own who you are, but be willing to do the work. And I'm willing to do the work. So I think that makes me um, fearless and fierce. Beautiful. Charles Sutty, you are fearless and fierce. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen, do you want to share? Um, yeah, sorry, I came to school pick That's up. That's okay. Me. Um, <laughs> you and the family um, game. Well, one, one thing I want to say, I read something um, yesterday. I have no idea where, probably on Instagram, I don't know. Um, but it said, don't compare your behind the scenes with everybody else's highlight reel. And I thought that was really cool. Um, especially, like, you know, I'm a millennial. So I live in that world. And I did try to do that influencer thing. But I was like, what do I have to, I don't have anything to share with people. I'm like a mom. So, you know. Um, anyways, I stopped doing that because I have real jobs. But anyways, um, I think I'm really good with people. Um, and like everybody's best friend. I think that I'm one of those people that you could not see for 10 years. And you know, the moment you see them, you're best friends with them again. And I like that about myself. Mm. Oh. I like that about you too. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Come on, Susie. <laughs> um, something um, special about myself that I learned recently is that uh, I have a gift of being a projector. Mm. And that means that I can see moving parts around a situation or a group or, and I've known this my whole life. I've experienced it in school growing up and that, but that once I'm invited in to that situation, Situation, it's magical. Like I can contribute and give and pour out of myself in ways that just is the energy is amazing. And that's what I like about myself. Thank you, Susie. Patty, how about you? I was Trying to put it into words, I think that that one of my best qualities is that if I'm in your corner, I'm in your corner. Mm. That's it. And I value that about other people. You know, I don't have a huge circle of friends. I have a very small circle of friends. And I want to know that I can count on them, that I can be safe with them, uh, that I can trust them. And I want people to feel that about me. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle? Oh, no, I want to hear from Adrian. <laughs> okay. This is your party. Adrian? She's like, no. She's like, no. <laughs> I saw a little thing pop up. She said she had to go, but she, oh, where did it go? Oh, that was Eva. Had, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> You're mute, Adrian. 
Sorry. Yeah, that was me. I, was, yeah, I just looked at the clock. I, 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 did, I got a giggling and I apologize. It was fabulous. Um, so I said, well, uh, I'm, I think I'm very loyal and I'm a very hard worker. So, mm. so I love you, Adrian. Don't, I don't give up. It, well, unless it's not worth it, you figure out sometimes. But <laughs> I think if it's worth it, I'm not going to give up. People, yeah. projects, whatever it is, yeah. going to work until That's, it gets there. Cool. Yeah. So, Thank you, Adrian. Anyway. Thank you very much. I apologize, you guys. That's okay. Bye, Bye Adrian. Thank this you. This is fabulous. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So who's left? Is Eve still on the call or did she hop off? Eve is on and Michelle. Okay. Is Eve going to unmute or do you want me to go? No, it's, your part. it's your party. Eve, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Um, Hi, Eve. You know I hate this. I know. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm an awesome you. editor, but that's about all I know about how awesome I am. Well, Eve, uh, in in the spirit of Tony being our amazing guest today, uh, we're going to create a little hype crew for you. So you know you've not heard the last of us about how incredible you are. So... Uh, so just, I'm putting you on notice, Eve, that we're coming for you because we think, we think you're pretty extraordinary and we love you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And sure, I can use all the hype I can get. <laughs> and you are a fabulous editor. I will, I will attest to that. So thank you, Eve. Sure. Thank you. Where did Michelle go? Oh, there you are. Oh, I'm here. Where yeah, oh. who did we lose? We lost Adrian, but then we lost oh. Kristen. <clears throat> I think it was that too funny with her and the little kid. I was spending time listening to you, Tony, but I was watching the kid lit in the back. It was fascinating to me. <laughs> All the toys that that kid had, and he was playing with a paper to to <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> anyway, I think you know, I'll, I'll do one, but I'm going to do a caveat with it. And this is what you know, this is what we as women would probably say is that I think you know, for me. What I feel I'm really awesome at is that in business, and I'm going to clarify this because in business, I will try shit all day long. I mean, if somebody says, why don't we go there? I'm like, let's try it, right? I mean, again, and you guys, all of you that know me know that's true. In my personal life, that is so not the case. I'm like, in my personal life, it's extremely opposite. I'm like, I don't want to try new crap. I like the wine that I like. I like the kind of dinners I like. I like my schedule. You know what I mean? Everything's very like, regimented in a weird way. And I, you know, again, good. But I was thinking that as we were kind of coming up with, what are we good at? And I went, wow, that's really interesting. And in business, yeah, I feel it's a real strong thing. But in my personal life, it's not. So I thought that was kind of in my head. I went, wow, a little bit of, a, a little bit of an aha moment I got to share. Wow. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Sorry, can I ask everybody to do something? This is that I ask people to do since everybody has shared what they, a thing that they're really good at. I always ask everybody, raise your hand. So you guys raise your hand with me. I'm trying to get where you can see. Now I'll take it and turn it backwards like this. And then pat yourself on the back. And get in the habit of doing that. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Can we just hug ourselves? I gotta hug myself. <laughs> I know it. I always <laughs> tell women, raise your hand, turn it around, pat yourself on the back, because those That's are the right. things we don't pat ourselves on the back enough for those qualities and the, those okay. those abilities that we have. It makes That's a big right. difference when we celebrate ourselves for these things, these things that we have. And you think about it, when your friend does something good, you're like, we're going out for drinks. We got to take you out for cake. We got you celebrate them. <laughs> so it's really cool when we do that for ourselves. And even if it's just a happy dance in your kitchen, if it's a glass of wine, if it's patting yourself on the back, that helps us to commemorate those good things that we do and those great qualities that we have. And you know, it. the world yeah, so. needs more cake. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Tony, how do we get your book? How do we have somebody wants to get your book? How do they get your book? You can get it at, at myhypebook.com. That was my, you broke up a little bit, Tony. It was myhypebook.com. 
Yes, yes, I'll put it over here in the, in the chat. Great, um, is it plural, yeah. myhypebooks.com or hype book? Hype, hype book, one, um, here, I'll put it in the, hypebook.com. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, Perfect. I can do it and, um, um, if you let me know that you're getting one, then I'll, I'll sign it for you. It's a, it's yeah. a pretty cool, um, um, I have to say it's a pretty cool book. I'm, I'm super proud of it because it's different and it's a cool thing for people as well. Good. Let me hear yeah, you somebody, say that proudly. It's a pretty freaking cool book. It's not a, sort of. It's a pretty awesome book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it, it really. Tony and I have a mutual friend, and she gifted me Tony's book uh, before Aww. I had the chance to meet Tony. So, oh, cool. uh, I, I want to second that. Tony, your book is absolutely amazing, and it is a gift. And uh, everybody be, would be really well served by uh, diving into it and becoming, you know, their own their own hype man or hype woman. So, um, yeah. but everybody, thank you for the love today, and this was absolutely <laughs> amazing. And I will share. Um, what uh, I, I will share my hype with you since I didn't do that. Uh, and that is that I am an extraordinary listener and my superpower is love and sincerity and truth. And I have absolutely loved uh, being your host for today. And I'm gonna close us out with this little gem uh, by another author named Stephen Pressfield. And Stephen wrote a book called uh, Turning Pro and he wrote another book called The War of Art. And this is from The War of Art. The Artist's Life. Are you born a writer? Were you put on this earth to be a painter, a scientist, an apostle of peace? In the end, the question can only be answered by action. Do it or don't do it. It may help to think of it this way. If you were meant to cure cancer or write a symphony or crack cold fusion and you don't, you not only hurt yourself, even destroy yourself, you hurt your children, you hurt me, you hurt the planet. You shame the angels who watch over you, and you spite the Almighty who created you, and only you, with your unique gifts for the sole purpose of nudging the human race one millimeter farther along, back to, back to its path to God, to the truth. Creative work is not a selfish act or a bid for attention on the part of the actor. It is a gift to the world and every being in it. Please. Do not cheat us of your contribution. Give us what you've got. We are waiting. So that's it, everybody. That. Thank you so much. I adore you, ladies. It's meant the world to me to be able to host this today, and I will see you all very soon. Well done, Jean-Marie.